Welcome to the Executive Talk. Uh, I've read a lot of articles about you, and in every each one of these articles, uh, there is one line written about you, you're a born communicator. Do you have to be a born communicator to be working in a field like you do, which is not so easily understandable for a lot of people? Hmm. It's actually a very interesting question. Um, and I remember my discussion at Nestle, uh, when I was nominated uh, head of research, and I asked a question, what are actually the important values, why you would consider a very young person, I was very young at the time, the first female in this position, why would I actually fulfill this cri criteria? And I thought, strong scientific background, maybe strong leadership, uh, etc. And actually the answer was, uh, the ability to communicate science to um, a non-scientific um, audience is what we are really looking for. So I guess there must be something to it. So do you <laughs> think that's something that's lacking also in your field? So in the field of science, that there are a lot of people who might be brilliant at what they do, but they're not so brilliant in communicating what they do. I think this is actually a huge problem, yes. I think uh, many of the scientists are actually not born communicators. Um, and But today it's really an important aspect of actually selling your science to investors, to reviewers, etc., etc. And actually in our field, in the biotech field, unless you can really inspire investors, your environment, that your science is worthwhile, better than anybody else, I think it will not work very well. So in communication in a biotech environment is even more important than in university. And here you see a clear difference between uh, Europe and America. In America you are trained, even as a, a child, to give presentations on your subjects, etc. Um, whereas in Germany for sure, and in Switzerland I think equally, you are not trained to do that. And that's certainly something I learned in America, to present your science and present it to in a way that a more general audience can understand it. And I love to do it actually. Uh, <laughs> you, you, you have been working uh, quite a long time in, in, in yeah. the US and uh, you're German, you know Switzerland uh, as well, uh, oh. very much, you're Swiss by now as well. Uh, if you say that you, you, you maybe sometimes miss the way that, uh, that these things yeah. were communicated in in the US. Uh, is there also a risk there that they might be overselling things as well? Mm -hmm. That you know that you see the other way around here that you say, okay, we're more modest, but yeah. maybe we're not overselling. Well, if, if effectively. So these are the two balances, right? The one which everything is great uh, and awesome versus uh, everything is a sort of okay. So I think it's the proper balance which uh, makes it. Uh, I would say a winning situation for us as a company. I mean, there are very clear guidelines in terms of communication. The science has to be strong, the science has to be right, and our communication has to be to the point and certainly not overstated. And here, I think with that sort of communication um, strategy, we are actually today really recognized in the field of Alzheimer's, of somebody people trust, investors call when they have questions. So we, we gained a lot of credibility by doing, I would say, the best possible communication on the subject. How important is that communication skills, if we come back to that, uh, in, in, in your situation where you're, you're, you're in the research field, uh, you're uh, researching uh, something that is very difficult, that mm. is not easily understandable, as we said, and most importantly, you don't have a product out at the moment. So uh, there is one product in, in the la last stage of research. Uh, I think that's the third stage. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. How important is it to, to be able to communicate all this and, and you know, maybe have people uh, be a little bit patient about it and, and investors and, and, and shareholders and everyone who wants to see a product as quickly as possible? I would say number one is a good sign. So uh, communicating bad signs doesn't work. So number one, my first priority is to have some of the best, if possible, the best leading signs in the world. And I think with that basis, uh, if you add good communication, I think that's the winning case. Um, and right now, yes, we are in late stage development, but there are many, many, many um, 
results on the way to our final result, which is potentially next year, um, which in fact are highly interesting, highly innovative. I mean, that day they can imagine, everybody speaks about these plaques in the brain, mm. um, that this gives you Alzheimer. So far, nobody could actually measure these um, in beta, so it's a protein which leads to these plaques, in the, um, in the brain fluid of a patient and actually show that yes, this occurs, this most toxic compounds occurs, and actually our drug can reduce it in people and can actually lead to a complete detoxification of this toxic protein. So this is after all this research, it's the first time this year that we could actually show that with this, in fact, phase three product. So we are actually quite excited on our way <laughs> to the last result, um, which means showing benefit, uh, clinical, clinical benefit in, in patients. Y you're very excited and you're very, you're very passionate when you talk about the, the, the subject. And, and, and I mean, you always ask, asked about it as well. So that makes you also the, one of the experts in the field of Alzheimer's. What in the beginning made you uh, take that step. As you said before, you were working for Nestle, uh, you had a very high position there. Then there was that possibility to, to redo everything and to, you know, to start with a startup like, like this one here. What made you do that step and what, what, what was it in that field of research for, for a cure for Alzheimer's that really attracted you and that made you change your kind of life path? Well, I actually, my interest in the brain was already there at Nestle. So I was interested in general in health, and in particular, how we as a food company at the time can actually improve the health of people, maintain the health of people, potentially prevent diseases. So that was really sort of almost like an imprint in my genes. It's almost genetic. And um, so we, you know, we were interested in cardiology, interested in cancers, all the different things that people are suffering from. But actually the brain was almost a little bit uh, left alone. And of course coffee with caffeine mm -hmm. works on the brain. So I was very interested already at that time to understand the benefits of coffee and, and caffeine and how we can communicate it. Um, actually it was, um, I would, several years before we uh, created AC Immune, I was actually making a huge collaboration with the APFL, focusing on the effect of nutrients on the brain. So my Back when you were with in, Nestle. In Nestle, yeah. yeah. So I was very, and we had many, in fact, the first Alzheimer's studies um, and food supplements, et cetera, et cetera, were actually done in Nestle. So my interest was already there. But when the four scientific founders of um, AC Moon finally came along um, and showed me their technology, um, I was uh, really intrigued by the technology. But we had no product, um, we had a technology, we had no money, basically. So to make this jump into creating a startup, no business plan, by the way, either. Mm. Uh, was that sounds risky. It, w it was risky, and uh, so when I was sort of started to think about it, um, it was a certain time in my life where I said, okay, now I achieved quite a bit, so what's next? Um, it wasn't really a midlife crisis, I would say, but it was sort of reflecting on the future, and I said, well, didn't I start out at some point to find a cure for cancer? Because when I work, was working in America, that is what I really, really wanted to do. I wanted to find a cure for cancer, uh, at least for certain types of cancer. And um, when I left actually the National Cancer Institute to, um, to come back to Europe, um, well, my dream was still there, but then the circumstances were mm, not the ones I was sort of looking for, although I had achieved so much. And uh, so then this uh, sort of made me reflect and ask my husband what he would think. And he thought um, that I was um, slightly crazy. Um, my mom was more direct. Um, she felt I made a huge mistake. Uh, but then uh, she started to pay me, after I really made the decision to do that, 200, 200 francs per month to support my creation of a business plan. That was her contribution. So mm -hmm. I thought it was very cute and I will never forget this. 
Um, well, and then when I decided to do it, and um, the first three months were hard until we had a business plan, but then already a few months later we were financed, uh, and then afterwards like, actually the company went like this. So we were Nowadays you even listed at, at the NASDAQ, but yeah. back then, I mean, that was really back to square one, if, if I, if I understand nothing, you. Even zero. Correctly, or <laughs> square zero. zero. Uh, how much did the, the, the chance to be, to be an entrepreneur uh, play into that, into that decision as well? I mean, it's, it's, you wanted to do something for a good cause, if I understand you correctly. Uh, but was it also a thinking or a thought that you, you, you had the impression, maybe now it's a time to do something for myself, and maybe not for Nestle, but really stand for something with, with, with your name and with, with, uh, uh, with everything you have and everything you do? Well, I think um, my wish, my desire, my dream to contribute something to society, um, which has a long-term value um, to make something positive for the world was very strongly expressed. And this aspect of changing health, I mean, making health, giving health back to people who lost it for whatever reason was really, as I said, almost genetic because that, uh, both of my parents had chronic, dis chronic diseases as a child. I felt I was suffering, maybe not even directly, but it influenced me. And so this was the moment where I said, well, now is the moment. So if I really want to do this, then that's maybe the dream I was waiting for. Now let's get started. So I think entrepreneur for me means to make a contribution to the world. And there are many, many entrepreneurs who actually have made this step. And look what entrepreneurs actually created, um, treatments for cancer. But when we have the other side, internet, you know, this is all coming from people who believed in something and implemented. And I thought this was the right moment for me to take this energy, uh, my knowledge, of course, which I had uh, collected over time, and work on my dream. And by the way, there's a common uh, saying here in, in, in AC Mune, it's we are going to the moon. The moon means for us here in AC Mune actually to find a treatment for Alzheimer. So that, that ultimate goal that you yeah, work on. So the vision was really, so my communication was, we had after two years, things became a little bit, lit, I would say a bit more difficult. Uh, we still had to find more money. It took longer, uh, certain things. So I gave, um, a ve actually I, I met uh, uh, Nelson um, and uh, he sort of said to me, you know, I actually recuperated um, South Africa. Um, I made South Africa a better country, but you, young lady, you do more. You c make a contribution to the world. I never forget this. I was, it was in South, Af in South Africa, and I came back, and I actually spoke to my people, organized a, um, a meeting, and I said, look, I'm just coming back from uh, my interaction with Nelson Mandela. I want to communicate this to you. I want to tell you what this man gave to me. So we should never give up. So let's go to the moon. Let's make this world better. So it's a real, a real experience I had. Uh, th that mm. that challenge that you have, and, and, and you, you you talked mm. about it. Mm. That you know, having having had parents uh, who mm. were chronically ill mm. uh, during during uh, uh, your your childhood years and your youth mm. years, and you, you you said in interviews mm. as well that that you always had the fear also. That can I really can I really study? Can I finish yeah. what I want to do? Can mm. I do the job that I want mm. to do. So in doing what you do now, is it almost like fighting your old demons in a way, or is it something like a catharsis, or would that would that go too far? I think you would go too far. I think it influenced me. And you know, sometimes when you see family uh, situations, uh, sick parents, I almost suffer with them because I experienced it so much. But then at the same time, I always tell them, look, it didn't make me weaker, it made me stronger. The reason why I can do all of that, why I can make potentially this contribution, help other people, it's because I experienced it. So don't take it as a negative, take it as a positive. Speaking of positive, are you a positive leader? You have uh, you have been leading people for, for a long time now, already with Nestle, you had a huge team. Uh, behind you, uh, are you a positive leader or how, how would you define your leadership skills? It's a very good question. Um, I think what is important to me that I create as a leader, I create an environment and that's really important where the people can be happy. So whatever happens around you, I, my 
conviction is that you have to be in a good environment. The people have to like to communicate with, with each other. They have to like to go for lunch with each other. So the communication, I mean, the environment has to be right. So my biggest responsibility I always uh, look for is that the people working here are in principle happy. Now there's the other things, which is the stress by investors that you have to finance the company properly so that we have to deliver the milestones and obviously um, to have a clear um, delivery is also part of it because if in fact we don't deliver and there is not enough money so then the happiness will quickly go away mm -hmm. so above the happiness is of course a clear vision where the company has to go a clear strategy a clear delivery plan so that all this happy happiness can exist and um, I would say I lead by really living what I'm saying. I would never ask anybody in this organization to do what I wouldn't be willing to do. And this includes, by the way, vacuum cleaning, because when we started the company off, we had our first investor meeting, and that's what I did. I vacuum cleaned, <laughs> because I felt this was very important that yeah. the investors would invest. So it goes to this point. But I really believe that the people have to see that you're serious, that you're, that you're working hard, that you are doing the very best for this company, for your people. And I think I strongly believe in people. I'm convinced that if a company is successful, it's the people who, in fact, bring the success to the company. It's their success, it's not my success. The company, by the way, everybody in AC Union has shares, every single one. And they always tell our people, it's your company, so make the best out of it. So you share responsibility, but you also, you oh, also share the success. In a way. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. It's their company, it's their achievement. It's funny when you hear you speak and you, you talk about, mm -hmm. you know, the, the first thing of all of, of happiness and, and of, of, of sharing tasks mm -hmm. and sharing uh, 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 responsibilities, even going to the to vacuum mm -hmm. cleaning, uh, mm -hmm. cleaning yourself. And I'm very well aware of the, of the thin eyes I'm walking on at the moment. But if I hear that, mm -hmm. I first of all think of, of female uh, mm -hmm. a female leadership in a way and I know that's that's very cliche in a way but would you would you would you agree that it's it's got to do something with maybe you being a, a female leader that you have these values in in your company I was I, you're asking a very good question which I ask myself quite often uh, I think as a female leader you have a bit more of intuition maybe maybe this caring for people uh, is sort of again genetic um, so I think there is a certain dimension to it. On the other hand, you have to be as hard, as successful, as delivering, as... Um, Some might even claim you have to be harder and more successful than a man. Maybe, mm. I don't know. But uh, so there's this other part which you have to do as well. But for me, my seven cents always helped me. I mean, it never, never put me down. So this feeling, this sort of what you do, I mean, is very strong and I use it. I use it in the best possible way. You once said when you came from the US yeah. to Europe, you were almost a bit surprised how often you had to answer that question, how, you know, you being a leader and a woman at the same time, that's a question that's never asked in, in the US. Yeah. Uh, but nowadays you say it's, it's, it's kind of a good question because you, 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 you say you want to give something back and you want to you yeah. also um, uh, make other, other uh, female leaders and also in the science field mm -hmm. aware of what's possible. Mm -hmm. uh, would, you, would you consider yourself as a kind of a role model or would that go too far? Well? I hated it actually. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I mean, it was asked so many times. I really hated this question and I definitely hated to be a role model. But in fact, there were a few um, events where I said, well, maybe there is something. One was uh, back in Nestle uh, when we were in the R&D committee. There were very few women and it was one of them. I was um, one of the more senior ones. And for whatever reason, all the young female leaders were always sitting on my table. And I thought, hmm, interesting. Um, what do they you know, expect? And I felt that we wanted to see how I built my career, what is necessary for them to get to this step. So that was one experience. And then here, actually, quite a few of our young scientists, they came to me and I said, well, Andrea, 
I mean, what do we have to do to get your job in the future? Very direct, mm. and I said, well, good question. Work hard already, <laughs> be outstanding, and be different. And, um, and I said, well, can you help us? So actually, I realized that uh, naturally, uh, these uh, outstanding young vi women were looking up to me and were seeing something positive. And I said, well, if it's like this, then yes, maybe that's what one needs to do. To make uh, to make it possible, and we have many many small things. We have small companies, so but uh, we are doing many things. For example, we always have students here in the office, um, whom we let experience business life. So we always have in summer uh, a few students who would work as administrator mm -hmm. in the legal department. You're seeing something but science, and quite a few actually then came back afterwards after they had the experience in doing their student time in ACMU and are actually working for us now. So it's, it's actually very nice because you can also test them. But we want that these uh, young female students, that they get an easier access to, to the business life and they can make it. So yeah, we do on a small level. When you look at those those young uh, mm. entrepreneurs in in, in, mm. in the making or the young mm. uh, the young business people, would you like to be young again uh, nowadays or be twenty again, twenty five, and have all these possibilities and maybe who knows be at the forefront of actually you know curing a lot of uh, illnesses that that we are not yet uh, able to cure? Well, I have to tell you that I still feel very young, uh, so <laughs> so I. I think I, um, I mean, obviously I want to make ACMU successful, I have many, many ideas I would still like to implement. For example, one of my dreams is still another dream to um, use food as a source of health, mm -hmm. even stronger than it's today. For example, how can you, can you actually use food to prevent Alzheimer is one of my big topics. Could that be a possible collaboration with Nestle again? Well, one day, yeah, maybe. Um, so I think there are aspects which um, coming from the food which we are not utilizing enough and of course having these two backgrounds between food and pharma uh, puts me in a certain position that I can you know f put things together so that's one of the dreams I have to use food much more for people to um, prevent diseases so we have ideas so actually um, I would say I don't think I think about retirement in very much in contrast to my classmates who are all speaking about retirement and traveling. Mm. Well, uh, I have seen the world, so I don't need to see so more of the world. Yet. I would definitely, um, as a project rather than retirement, create the next company. So, uh, almost last question. When we come back to Andrea Pfeiffer, as as a young girl, actually, mm. I, I read <laughs> somewhere that as a teenager you came mm -hmm. to Switzerland to ski. And all you said there is, oh, it's quite boring here. Uh, have you have you learned to love Switzerland as it is? Do you still think it's a bit boring? Have you have you found your home here? Uh, it's, uh, it, uh, I must say, I still suffer from this statement, and I can. So it is true then. Uh, it is absolutely <laughs> true. And my father, when he was still alive, he was always telling me, in particular when I bought my first house and asked for help, uh, he said, "Didn't you?" say that Switzerland is boring and now you're telling me you want to buy a house? Are you serious? And it's actually in the same location where I'm now in Leve. Um, so I had to admit that my, my uh, judgment of a situation has quite dramatically <laughs> changed and that many of the things, the beauty of the landscape, the mountains, the lake, etc., etc., are now very important. And both of my, my husband and I, we have decided that actually we will stay in Switzerland um, even after retirement, whenever this will be. And as we <laughs> just heard, it will not be in the next uh, coming um. years. Uh, final question, something completely different. You, you, you've met a lot of important and interesting people. We just heard Nelson Mandela. Mm -hmm. Another one is Steve Jobs. Mm -hmm. What have you learned from him? If you, if you could put it in one sentence, is there something you, you, you've taken from him for, for, for your business, for your life? Well, it was at the WWF and I was uh, very lucky and very thankful actually that we were invited as young technology pioneer to um, attend the World Economy Forum in Davos. Um, and it was really impressive because you have this environment where you can talk to all these great leaders, mm -hmm. um, Bill Clinton, uh, Bill Gates, who were all somehow around you and you could actually talk to them. 
And um, so, yeah, here my question was to Steve, well, how do you actually manage to give this outstanding presentation? It was very close to my heart because he was so relaxed in his Californian style, at the same time so serious. And um, so I really, this was really important to me. And he looked at me, I think he was smiling, and he said, practice, practice, practice. And now when we are sometimes uh, giving presentations, we actually train our next generation uh, for scientific presentations. Then, and they ask me, well, how do I do this now? And I say, practice, practice, practice. So. Which brings <laughs> us back to communication where we started. <laughs> Thank you very much, Andrea Pfeiffer. Thank you. You're very welcome. <laughs>